All right, hey, oh my God, I'm back again. Tell your brother, tell your sister, tell your friends, all right? Um, it's a little bit of uh, Backstreet Boys there for you. As you guys probably don't know the Backstreet Boys are or were, but uh, I did. They were popular a long time ago, okay, back when I was, well, it was a long time ago. Anyways, I, I think I posted this yesterday, the Bill of Rights. It's important. Bill of Rights is a big deal. All right, not unlike your teacher, I'm a big deal. But um, all jokes aside, I'm not, I'm not comparing myself to the Bill of Rights. Just saying, Bill of Rights is very important. Okay, and that's why we're studying it here in civics and economics. That is also why there is a quiz on the Bill of Rights, which I just put on Canvas. Now I'm going to upload this video um, on Canvas as well to help you out. I put yesterday the assignment was on the Bill of Rights. Today, the assignment is a quiz about the Bill of Rights. All right, this, this is a quiz grade. So let's let's just, hey, let's go through it here. Boom, all right, First Amendment. So the Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution. Remember, those uh, anti-federalists would not ratify the Bill of Rights and let, would not ratify the Constitution unless it had a Bill of Rights within it. So, because they wanted protections for the individual. Remember, the anti-federalists were very suspicious or weary of a big government. That is a reaction to the, uh, the, the, the government that England imposed upon the, the colonies. All right, so they're, they're suspicious of the big government. But remember, they had the with the Constitution is a movement more towards a big government because those articles of confederation did not work. So let's go ahead and get into it. First Amendment guarantees people always think, well, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, but not only that, there are other ones. So free speech right there, religion, assembly, the right to assembly, uh, petition, make a formal request by the government. It has a lot of things in it. All right. Um, five things in it right there. Uh, are, are listed so you can uh, express yourself with speech you can publish things and then you can practice you know your religion there's no there is no state religion remember if you remember while why those puritans came to the the new world to the colonies is because england had what's called the church of england where you basically had to be part of that church to live there, um, and freedom of assembly. So with the protest, protests that are going on today in America, a lot of that has to do with freedom of assembly, all right? Um, and the government often protects this. For instance, there was a case several years ago where um, the, the, the Nazi party in America petitioned to do a protest or do a rally. Now they went through all the steps to do this, and one of the the uh, judges that looked at it, even though he was Jewish, all right, which Nazis are against Jews, neo Nazis are. He said, "Hey, look, they went through this. They made this petition. They went through all the correct steps. So he granted them the right to to do their little rally or whatever they were doing." Uh, but with these freedoms, so freedom of speech, I always try to tell students, does not mean freedom of consequences. All right? You cannot just go out and say whatever you want to say. There are restrictions on it. In other words, if you say something that puts others in danger, that is, uh, you could say, well, the freedom of speech gives me the right to do that, but it doesn't. It's restricted in some sense. So the, the example that's often cited is hollering fire in a crowded theater. If the theater is crowded and you holler fire, everybody's going to stampede and run for the exit and people are going to get hurt. All right. So that um, is an example that's often cited or that's kind of often used that you cannot just say anything because there are certain instances where that freedom of speech is limited and there are consequences with it. But the First Amendment, not only freedom of speech, there are other ones there as well. So the Second Amendment, one that students uh, often cite or often talk about, the right to bear arms. Now, I had a discussion with my graduate school professor several a few years ago about this, and it's a, kind of a convoluted 
um, amendment. In other words, the original intent was for citizens to be able to protect themselves over abuse from the government. Today, all right, that's not why it's still in place. In other words, if I want, I have the right to bear arm or own a weapon, all right, that, the, the, that has not going to stop the government from doing anything against me. Because anyway, the government has what? They have tanks, they have bombs, they have all these massive weapons. So me owning a gun is not why, uh, is not going to do anything against the, the government's power. But it's still used today uh, for certain things as far as protection from others as well. So the right to serve in a militia and own a gun. It's one that certain uh, factions of our populace are very um, invested in, and they're very supportive of that, that amendment, the right to bear arms, the Second Amendment. The third one has to do, remember, I, I told you this before, it's kind of a reaction of that quartering act that Great Britain impressed upon the colonies, that there is no forced housing of soldiers. In other words, just because someone serves in the military, you do not have to house them or keep them in your house. Uh, you don't have to keep uh, troops in your house during times of war. So that's the Third Amendment. Uh, not necessarily used today that much because, like, I was in the Marine Corps and they provided, the government provides its, uh, its military members with housing whether you stay in a barracks or if you're married, they'll give you a stipend for or housing allowance place, um, to, to, to buy a house or rent a house or whatnot. But that's the Third Amendment, no forced housing. The Fourth Amendment also, another very important one, is no illegal searches or seizures. So this is an example I tell students is if you are driving and the police pulls you over so i tell you what about six months ago i got pulled over because i was driving in a lane next in a, a there was i was driving on highway one and there's a, a school right there on highlight highway one it's a private school and the policeman was there directing traffic well i was in the wrong i should have moved over into the left hand lane but I didn't, and uh, so sure enough, he came and pulled me over and alerted me to to that law. And uh, so, I mean, I didn't get a ticket or nothing, but he just told me that. Now, if he would have asked, I had a bag in my car for my uh, my baseball stuff because I coach baseball here at the school, so it was my like my baseball uniform and stuff in that bag. If he would have said, "You mind if I look in that bag?" I I really, I probably would have been like, all right, yo, you, you can look in the bag if you want, but I have the right to tell him no, because he did not have a warrant for uh, to look in that bag. Um, so police, they must have a search warrant before they search your your uh, your belongings. All right, no illegal searches or seizures. The, it means the the individual citizen has a right to privacy. That is, uh, remember, because these anti-federalists were trying to protect the individuals. The government cannot just come in your, your, your house or your home and just start taking things, taking your property, looking through things. They have to have probable cause or a search warrant. Um, so that's kind of the, the, uh, the example maybe I use. Now, probable cause could be things to so say a bank has been robbed. And someone gets pulled over and they have a bag and there's like dollar bills fumbling or protruding through from the bag. Well, the government in that case would have probable cause or suspicion to say, well, take that and look at it, uh, that a crime could have been committed. Uh, but the Fourth Amendment protects you as a citizen against illegal search or seizure of property. The Fifth Amendment, also another very important one. And the way I explain this one to students is you probably have seen on the uh, in movies and stuff where a policeman or like if you're like me, when I was in high school, I used to watch this show. It was called Cops. I guess maybe it still comes on. But 
when someone gets arrested, what does the police say? You have the right to remain silent. All right, that is the Fifth Amendment, meaning um, you do not have to incriminate. You, you you have the right to remain silent, meaning you don't have to talk, which would incriminate yourself. You have what's called due process. Okay, that there's a process from arrest through booking through trial that we go through, and I see this today a lot on on TV with. Uh, celebrities athletes politicians they're always pushing for people to be arrested or people to be um thrown you know tried well what you have to realize in america we have something called due process where there's a process of evidence coming to light before that person can go on trial and be convicted of a crime and that this is very important because in other countries if someone you look at um, in the 20th century of Russia or even today in certain countries in the world, there is no due process. Someone who is convicted or, or thought sus suspected of a crime, they are immediately thrown in jail. They're not given um, any defense or anything, and then they are served with a penalty for their crime, even though there was no due process which would uh, show evidence of their crime. Eminent domain again is the uh, it protects the person against government taking property, and then a grand jury is a grand jury is different from a trial jury. A grand jury is people that look at the evidence and they decide basically if there's enough evidence there should be a trial or not. And then double jeopardy. So the way I explain double jeopardy is there um, if someone is is goes on trial for a crime and they are found innocent now even if years later there comes to light evidence that they actually did the crime they cannot be tried for that crime again all right so that's what double jeopardy one, one student last year i got in a discussion with one student about uh oj simpson so if you don't know who oj simpson was he was a a a superstar celebrity and he they thought he killed his wife and another person. And so he went to trial and they found him not guilty. Well, people still say, well, O.J. Simpson actually was the one who killed his wife and the other guy, too. And there's been more evidence, DNA evidence and whatnot, that would suggest that he did it. I said, well, you can't be tried again. All right. That's double jeopardy. Once you're found innocent, you can't go on trial again, even if there's stuff that comes out that you actually did it. So that's the Fifth Amendment, another very important one. Sixth Amendment, also important. Um, and you hear this sometimes in the reading of what's called the Miranda Rights. You have the right to remain silent. We, if you cannot afford an attorney, we will, the state will provide one for you. So the government will give a, an individual a lawyer or some type of legal representation if they do not have the money or the means to provide one for themselves, a speedy and public trial. In other words, if I go out here and they think I committed a, I committed a crime and they, they want to put me on trial for it, well, I can't be put in jail for five years before they put me on trial for, I don't know, some, some misdemeanor or not misdemeanor, but some small crime, some nonviolent crime. All right, um, speedy and public. So say there's a person out here, for instance, who is convicted of, of, of harboring drugs, has they have drugs. Well, he can't put them in jail for 10 years for a nonviolent offense, all right, before they go to trial. That is against the Sixth Amendment. It has to be somewhat, proceed with somewhat speed and be public. In other words, the, um, it, it, there has to be c other citizens that can view it um, and that uh, it's not closed off where because if things are closed off and done in private in this case then you have injustices that are done to the person that's put on trial an impartial jury or jury trial 12 impartial people all right so you can't get five, 12 people who they say even before the trial happens, well, we think he did it. He did it. 
or she did it. All right, that's not impartial. And then people have to be informed. You have to be informed of the charges against you. All right, so Sixth Amendment is important as well. Seventh Amendment, not one that's used typically, uh, not one we study as much as maybe some of the other ones, but you have the right to a jury trial in civil cases more than $20. So a civil case is different than a criminal case. A civil case involves money, all right? Um, the burden, of, and we'll study this a lot more, but the burden of proof is a lot less in a civil case than it is in a criminal case. All right, civil cases only involve money. You don't, you can't go to jail in a civil case. All right, a criminal case, you can. Eighth Amendment, no excessive bail or fine. In other words, if I, if not me, but if someone is convicted, I'll tell you like this. I've got one ticket in my life. All right, wasn't a speeding ticket. I got a ticket. When I, I think I may have told you all this. I got a ticket when I was in California because I was riding in the back seat. I didn't have my seat belt on. So it wasn't this, I, don't, I don't have a speeding ticket. I don't have anything else. I have one seat belt ticket. In North Carolina, you you didn't have to have a, a seat belt on in the back seat. But then I moved to California when I was stationed in the Marine Corps. You did. I wasn't aware of, aware of the law. You know, that's how it is. But they can't. The Eighth Amendment would protect me against a fine. I had to pay a fine. It was like $170, which to me is still excessive for not wearing a seatbelt. But they couldn't have made me pay $170,000 for that seatbelt ticket or give me five years in prison for a seatbelt ticket, seatbelt infraction. That would be a cruel and unusual punishment or an excessive fine. All right, so that's what the Eighth Amendment protects me against. Ninth Amendment um basically says all rights not listed are still protected so that's why the joker's on there it's like the joke card it still trumps all in other words meaning that if if the your rights just because it doesn't say it in the constitution doesn't mean that citizens don't have these certain rights so just because it doesn't say i have the right to wear a polo shirt today it doesn't mean I don't have that right. Okay, I still do, all right, just because it doesn't say it. So the Ninth Amendment is kind of like a cover all the bases type amendment for individuals. The Tenth Amendment is similar, but it goes, it's it's has to do with the reserved powers, which I went over a couple of days ago, and says that all rights not given to the national government. So if it's not listed in the Constitution about a national a right to the national government then that right then is reserved to the state governments. The states are the ones that uh, that make a decision on that issue. So it's reserved powers um, is what that would uh, entail. So the quiz I put on Canvas, um, you can watch this video to help you out with that. Look at the PowerPoint. You should have some good reference for the Bill of Rights after the assignment yesterday, the F-Puzzle assignment from yesterday. So let's try to get this done. If you have any questions, please uh, question about anything, all right, any assignment, life in general, you know, whatever, the Bill of Rights, hey, let me know. That's why I'm here, all right?